There is a call to arms. How will you respond? There is a call to arms crying out from across the world. How will you respond? Church, do not be mistaken. We are in a war. And, and Paul writes, our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 6, 12. See, Lottie Moon, which you'll see her on the screen in a second, was really not that different from most of us. She loved God. She loved people. She really loved her job. See, Lottie had the opportunity to, to respond to that call. She spent 40 years of her life as a career missionary in China. See, Lottie took this, this call that was on her life and, and responded to it in such a way that she, she went to a, a complete spiritual abyss where there were people who had never even been touched, never even heard the name of Jesus. She risked incredible danger. She endured famine and disease and illness with little to no medical support. She even uh, persevered during the, the Russian-Japanese war that kind of took place and many missionaries fled from China. She uh, at one point even went through this incredible famine to the point of almost starvation. All in her response to this call. You see, when we, when we look around the world, we don't have to go that far. We can just look at our own communities and, and there's a call. There's a call to arms coming out uh, from our own families, our own uh, spheres, our own worlds. See, God is broadcasting this to every single one of us, husbands and wives. Is your marriage worth fighting for? Mothers and, and fathers, are your children worth sacrificing for? Church, is the life transformation, the experience you've had through the knowledge and person of Jesus Christ, something that is intended to be hidden beneath a table? See, if Christians are willing to change their shopping habits because of a store's bathroom policy, how much more should we be willing to do when we come face to face with another person destined for hell. A few days ago, I had the opportunity, uh, I met these two guys that came to my front door and we talked a little bit and we scheduled an appointment for Friday and, um, and it was really cool. They were, they were great guys. We talked for almost two hours. You know, they were telling me stuff that they believed and I was telling them things that I had believed and it was, uh, it was really, really great. And kind of toward the end of the conversation, one of the young men looks to me and says, Scott, why exactly do you, did you want to talk with us? So if you haven't guessed by now, these two young men were member, are members of the um, Church of Latter-day Saints. Uh, you may know them as the Mormons as well. And so I, I said to him, I was kind of smiling and said, anytime someone's going to show up at my front door and wants to talk about the most important thing in my life, wants to have a conversation about the most important piece of information ever given to mankind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move heaven and earth. I'm going to make time for that conversation. God wants us to be moved to action. This, this call to arms is a call to action. For every unique person in here, there is a unique design but no matter the call, God will be glorified. See, Lottie Moon is an incredible woman who three types of calls that we're going to look at today. And as we go through each point, we're going to interact with major points in her life. So we're going to kind of go piece by piece. And through her example, what we're going to find is this warm embrace, a, a really powerful reminder that we are not alone in this fight. Though the road, though the path may be narrow and windy, it is heavily, it is well beaten and heavily traveled. You are not alone. Friends, my prayer this morning 
is that after we hear how God worked through the life of Lottie Moon, that we will have a greater sense of direction and an, an increased passion to serve God. A first point. God's non-ignorable call. So if you're taking notes, that's where we're at. So Lottie Moon was born Charlotte Diggs Moon, December 12th, so kind of close to my birthday, if y'all been paying attention. I'm 23rd, it's out there, uh, of, of 1840. So like, long time ago. Uh, not as long as some of the people we've talked about during this series, but a long time ago for me, because I only go back to 89, because my birthday, right? Uh, anyway, so goes back a long time ago. So 1840, her family was heavily these like really intense uh, church, staunch Baptists. The whole family just loved Jesus so much, except her. She rebelled against it and was often getting in trouble at school for pranks and she was incredibly intelligent. So maybe she was one of those people who uh, really struggled with the faith aspect, you know. She really wanted to think it through, which I totally get that. And it wasn't until she was about 18 years old when she was in college did she really begin to kind of grapple with these gospel truths, this message of Jesus Christ. And it was then, during college, that she dedicated her life to Christ. And see, I'd mentioned that she was really intelligent. Well, she was so intelligent that by, before she graduated college, she'd already learned close to five languages, including, including Hebrew and Greek. And later she would become, just after her undergrad, she would go on to grad school, and she would become one of the first women in all of the South to get a master's degree. Is this incredible, uh, incredibly intelligent woman. Uh, crazy thing is she's also like four foot three. She's really short. Um, I think, is Kenzie like four foot three? Pastor Dodd, I, I wanted to bring someone up who was like four foot three so we kind of get an idea of, uh, of Lottie Moon's height. She's little, but really smart, really, really passionate and kind of a prankster and a little bit of a rebel. I think some of us might be able to see some of those same traits in ourselves as well. And so as she... She began to develop this, this, this sense of a call to the other side of the world. She, she had said that she wanted to know who was taking the gospel to people who were so far away from America, specifically the, the Far East kind of area, so China, right? Well, again, remember, 1840 is when she was born, high school, college, master's degree. She's probably about in her, she's about in her 20s right now. It was not common, nor really even allowed, for a single woman to go and be a missionary all on her own. And so she had to wait. And so until then, she, she began to work as a teacher. She taught in Kentucky and another school in like Alabama and she met a friend and the two of them actually started a, uh, a high school for girls in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. By the time she was about 32, the Foreign Mission Board is the organization she she signed up with, they allowed single women to be missionaries. And they were sending people to China. So all these things really clicked out really well, clicked together really well for her. She was like, great, I'm going to go do it. But, and before we, I continue, I want to just kind of re, I want to remind us of the setting because I don't want us to miss the, the reality of what this woman was doing. So this is like 1872. And so if you're familiar with the book, movie, Gone with the Wind, we have Scarlett O'Hara kind of set, you know, Civil War Reconstruction era. And she's this Southern belle with her hair all did and, and her big poofy dresses. And her whole idea is like, I'm just going to marry rich and be taken care of and life's going to be great and all that stuff. That is the lifestyle that Lottie Moon was expected to live. Her family was incredibly wealthy. I bet you a life of comfort and elitism and incredible materials was waiting for her. She was already really intelligent. These things were waiting for her and she gave up everything. Something else delighted her more. Within a year, she would set sail for Tengchao, hope I said that right, China. It was, it was crazy. So I, I want to take a look at Psalm 119, 33 to 35 really quick. Should show up behind me in a second. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. That delight, that, 
that the psalmist who's saying that I, I have a favor, I have a delight, I love to be in your presence, to hear your commandments, to hear your laws and your guidance. God, it's powerful. I want us to take a look at this again. There's a quote from this book, and I'll have it, but it's called um, Finding the Will of God, and it's been written by Bruce Waltke, and the quote will appear behind me on the screen. He talks about how we can hear God's will. Receiving a message from God is nearly always in conjunction with having a loving heart toward God. The spirit of God in your life, together with the influence of the word, illuminates the thoughts of the Lord. As you put God's word into practice, he establishes your thoughts so that you can participate in his eternal plan. So here's kind of a tricky title. I titled this point, God's uh, Non-Ignorable Calling. It's kind of a tricky thing because the reality is plenty of people ignore God. Plenty of people reject God. We have to make God's call non-ignorable in our lives. So how do we make God's calling? How do we make the voice of God non-ignorable in our lives? It begins by creating a habit of diving into God's word, a habit of praying and seeking the face of God, increasing your love for God so that you just, you just delight in his statutes and commandments so that every single thing about God just charges you up and gets you so excited and just fills you and satisfies you and keeps you content. And in that moment, in that time, as Bruce Walkie was saying, we begin to find ourselves influenced by the Holy Spirit and transformed by the word of God. And through that, we begin to find that God's will is, is so compelling and so non-ignorable in our lives, we can't help but follow it. We can't help but offer everything we have unto it. Do you remember, if, you've, if you're married, do you remember that kind of that first year when you got married? Just kind of take a moment to reflect back on what that looked like for you. Hopefully it was a good one. Um, I remember my first year of marriage only five years ago. Um, Man, it was, it was a wild time for Mary and I. We lived in Lubbock, Texas, Red Raiders. And uh, it's good. And it was, it, was, it, was, it was crazy. We had a whole bunch of insane things happening, but it was fun. It was a lot of fun. We, we definitely had that like glowy, new, newlywed thing, you know, with all the romance and the like over the top everything. And so I remember one night I asked Mary Ann, hey, what kind of like, what's your favorite type of like date night kind of thing to do? And so she's like, Something about staying in and the comforts of home. And I'm kind of a flashy guy, you know, like, I like to like go out and like do crazy cool things. And so I'm like, stay at home, that's so boring. You know, but, but I loved her so much. I was so excited about everything. Anything she said was, was like a pleasant aroma, you know, it was phenomenal, right? And so I was like, okay, all right, comforts of home, I'll figure that out. And so for like the next three days, y'all, I'm planning this incredible like stay at home date. Like I got this, like I'm learning how to cook, the whole deal. <laughs> I'm learning how to cook, the whole deal. And uh, I'm getting like, I'm trying to buy like decorations, you know, make our apartment look really fancy. And I'm getting my friends in on it. And so like the day of, like we're out and I have my friends sneak into the apartment and they like set up all these little Christmas lights and stuff. So Marion would come back and be like, what, how'd this happen? And I'd be like, I did it. And all this like really cool stuff. And, uh, you know, and it was, I just wanted to do all, I, gave, I mean, I gave up so much time. And the, the funny thing is just uh, probably a couple, maybe a couple days ago, maybe last week, you know, Marion will say something like this. She'll be like, Scott, would you mind like helping clean the house just a little bit? And I'm sitting there kind of like, but I did. I took out the trash. And she's like, Scott, when I said take out the trash, I didn't mean take the bag out and stick it next to the bin. <laughs> and see, the funny thing is the, the degree of commitment, how much we're willing to offer when we're so enamored and so deeply in love with everything God asks of us. You see the difference? If we allow our love and our relationship with God to fade, then we begin to just kind of leave the trash can next to the bin. It becomes that much harder to follow and be faithful and that much easier to ignore God's calling. In order for God's calling to be non-ignorable in your life, and that's what you want, trust me, you want to be following God's calling, we have to make a habit of establishing a deeply loving relationship with him. You're not going to 
just drift closer to God automatically. Because the reality is, when left on our, on, on our, to our own, we just drift away from things. We just kind of move away. We need the counsel of the church. We need the body of the church. We need to have Sundays. We need to be here. Uh, my, the, the pastor who mentored me when I first came to know uh, Christ in college would tell me, every time you come to church, you're adding like a two by four to the house, to the wall of, your, of the structure of your faith. Every time you pray, you're adding another two by four. Every time we take the opportunity to delight ourselves in the disciplines of God, praying, reading your Bible, talking, fellowshipping, we're going to do that right after service. You are adding another two by four to the wall, strengthening your relationship with God. You see, we, we need that clarity of God's calling in our lives because it's what strengthens us to persevere when things get a little bit harder. And that takes us to our next point. God's enduring call. So, I'm 27. Um, I finished college. I was like 21 or so. So for the past six years, I've really been trying to, I've been struggling a little bit with the way the world works a little bit. Because when you're, when you're like 14, you're going into ninth grade and like, you know, new clothes, new school supplies, new stuff, woo! You know, soccer team, whatever you want to do, sports. And then that year's over. And then you're 15 and you go to the next grade and you're like, woo, new clothes, new stuff, new teacher. And you, you kind of like, every year has something. And if you had like a, like a class with some kids you really didn't like, just give it a year. They'll be gone. You'll be in a new place. Things kind of worked out pretty quick. Um... A lot of things changed really fast during those like teen years. But then I got out of school and all of a sudden things kind of take a while. Um, paying off student loans, it's going to take a while. This new mortgage we got, it's like 30 years. If we, <laughs> that's a long time, that's older than me. And um, like things take a while. People take a while to change. Some things just take time. How beautiful is it though that, and what we're going to see is that God's calling endures and we have the opportunity to, parallel, to respond in parallel by enduring with that call. And we're going to see what happens here with Lottie. See, it would take about 16 years for Lottie to see any legitimate church begin during her ministry there. 16 years. I said she was there for 40, right? So we're almost, almost 50% of the time she spent in China under incredibly harsh conditions, she saw nothing. So for 16 years, she continued to persevere, trusting that God's calling on her was, was everlasting, was still there. It wasn't just a temporary one-time thing. It was be present, be here, take the gospel to this unreached people. It, it took a while. During those 16 years, she suffered from extreme loneliness some of the disease and, and the illness, it actually, at, toward the end of her life, um, she had some kind of like brain abscess thing and actually caused her to have hallucinations. And it was incredibly difficult for her. She did have a guy who, who proposed to her, um, but she said no. She turned down this, this proposal, um, ultimately saying that her, she needed to be in this, in this missionary role, more importantly. And... He had some stuff about Charles Darwin that she didn't agree with. And so, it's a really cool thing, and I don't know if we've had this with any of our other um, our people, but Lottie Moon has hundreds of letters she wrote back almost weekly. Definitely monthly during her time. Well, probably monthly, because for anyway. She wrote back monthly talking about what was going on in China. And so I'm going to read to you one of her letters, and it should be on the screen behind me as well. What we find missionaries can do in the way of preaching the gospel, even in the immediate neighborhood of this city, is but as the thousandth part of a drop in the bucket, compared with what should be done. And I do not pretend to aver that there is any spirit among the people. They literally sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. The burden of our words to them is the folly of and sin of idol worship. We are but doing pioneer work, but breaking up the soil in which we believe others shall sow a bountiful crop. But 
as in the natural soil, four or five laborers cannot possibly cultivate a radius of 20 miles, so cannot we, a mission of five people, do more than make a beginning of what should be done. Lottie completely understood that what she was doing was going to take a long time. I had the opportunity, um, and thank you church for allowing me, I missed a Sunday in April while I was on a mission trip uh, in Can- to Kansas and actually Dakota West went with me. And it was such a pioneering trip. I kind of got a small taste of what it looks like to go somewhere, want to share the gospel, want to do all this great work for God and no one care. And to leave without really, you know, any much, much changing. But to know that it was a pioneering trip that set in place and set in motion what hopefully we, we pray is a bountiful crop for those who will come after. I, I've heard, I, I like the analogy that, you know, sometimes we're, we're planting seeds, right? I, I once had a, a, an older gentleman tell me, you know, Scott, sometimes we get to plant the seed, sometimes we get to water it, and you know, sometimes we get to be the one to harvest it, and, you know, hallelujah. But most of the time, I feel like I'm just pulling the weeds, <laughs> just, just keeping it clean so it can grow, dealing with some of the harder stuff. It made me think of, um, of David. I want, I want to read this verse really quick. 1 Samuel 16, 13. So Samuel took the horn full of olive oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. The spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day onward. Then Samuel got up and went to Ramah. So that verse alone doesn't really offer any like inspiration or, or massive revolutionary truth. But put into the context of the whole narrative of David's life, what we see is that David was 16 years old when he was anointed by this prophet of God to ultimately become and ascend the throne, to become the king of Jerusalem. He was 16 years old. As you read through scripture, you'll see that he actually does not become king until he's 30 years old. So there's 14 years that David was like, I'm going to be king. What's the deal? Like, you know, remember, like, see, like, the Lion King with Simba? Just can't wait to be king. You know, like, he can't wait. But David somehow, not only did he wait, not only did he trust in this call, but he had something more difficult he had to do as well. You see, a year later, over this time that would pass, the current king, Saul, began to kind of go a little crazy. And he was jealous and envious and, and began to hate David and actually began to hunt him and try to have him killed. You'll read that David was hiding out in caves with, with 400 men. And the entire time, David is still being faithful unto God. Scripture will say that David was a man after God's own heart. You see, how easy would it have been for David to, to sit there in that cave, sleeping on jagged rocks, probably didn't have a tempur pillow, and, and say to himself, maybe I deserve this. Maybe I did do something wrong. Maybe I'm not the one that God meant to call. I, I must have done something wrong. You know, think about Lottie Moon. How easy would it have been for her to say to herself, man, nothing's happening because I'm not a very good missionary. Because I'm incapable of being competent to share the gospel. Maybe I'm not praying hard enough. I mean, how easy is this to do. We do it to ourselves all the time. We say these lies and we bring ourselves down thinking we deserve less. I once heard someone say that we, we accept the love we, th- we think we deserve. You know, and, and, and we, get, we get stuck in this. And I really love this quote. I've been reading this book called Uninvited by Lisa Turkhurst. Uh, really cool book. I think it's for women, but I was like, hey, I want to learn more. It's a phenomenal book, so ladies, you should definitely check it out. It's a great book. But it ha- she has this quote. She says this, God's love isn't based on me. It's simply placed on me. And it's the place from which I should live. Loved. See, God's call might take a long time to come full circle, and it is absolutely vital that we operate from a position of victory and redemption. We, we cannot distract ourselves from what God is doing, what God has called us to, by looking inward at our own personal insufficiency, by saying we're not worthy of this thing God's called us to do. We cannot lose sight of the fact that God has placed his love on you 
And it is not based on your performance. God's going to fill in the gaps. Look at Moses. He said, I, I am slow of speech. I, might, I have a heavy tongue. I stutter. And God gives him Aaron. What if they don't trust me? He gives them a staff. He gives them everything he needs. God will equip you as he calls you. See, we must remain steadfast to God's enduring call. So many of the really cool things that happen, and um, I, I love the story of, in Genesis with Joseph. You know, he's, he's this kid, and his, his brothers try to kill him. They throw him in the pit, but then he's sold into slavery. But then he, then he like rises up the ranks when he's bought by this Egyptian pharaoh. But then his wife uh, lies about, the, uh, about Joseph. All, and all these crazy things keep happening to him. And then he goes to jail, and then, you know, uh, he meets these guys and he's like, hey, I'll help you interpret your dream. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll tell the Pharaoh about you when I get released. And then they forget about him. And all this stuff happens in Joseph's life. And you know how quickly it happens for us? We just turn the page. And guess what? Joseph's out of jail. How awesome. What a miracle. But when Joseph was sitting in that prison, he didn't have a, a Genesis chapter 46 or something to look at and flip the page and know the ending. He had to persevere and trust that God had an enduring call that would be seen from the beginning all the way through the end. He had to be faithful still. So much of the Bible, we, we just kind of fast forward. We get like all the good parts. We miss out on the parts that are just kind of slow. The book of Acts, I mean, there's so many crazy things happening, but it took years and years and years to move from one event to the next. But scripture puts it just two verses down. I love this promise that comes from Jesus. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It comes from Matthew 28, and that takes us to our next point. God's global call. See, in total, Lottie Moon spent those 40 years of her life in China. She only left when she was 72 years old because her fellow missionaries forced her to go home. You see, there had been this, this, uh, this horrendous famine I talked about earlier. People were starving and dying. She took all the money she had, all the food she had, and gave it to everyone and did, did not eat anything herself. In the bulletin uh, on the back, it says that when she died, she, was only, she weighed only 50 pounds. She started a, a Red Cross station. She started another women's missionary union organization. She even helped a whole bunch of dogs, which is awesome. And she did so much all out of her own expense. The Foreign Mission Board, the agency that sent her, was, was drowning in debt. They were, they were struggling. No one was able to give money. I mean, remember, this is Reconstruction era. The United States is severely wounded from a very harsh civil war. And she's over here in China, struggling. She still, in her rebellious spirit, wouldn't take no for an answer. Often, if you were to read her letters, which you can find online, she always asks, send more people. Send more. Send your prayers. Send, send some financial gift. We need money because money will help us establish infrastructure in this community where we can do more ministry. She wasn't afraid to ask for money. And so she had this idea she wrote to this missions uh, magazine that was published around the country and said, how about we take just an offering the week before Christmas and all the money will just go to missions. If we can get two more missionaries, two more women to come, that'll be a good start. One of her letters is really funny how she phrases it. She's like, actually, we need dozens, but I'll settle for two because I'm trying to be polite. And what happens is the women who read this story were just so inspired because they've been following Lottie's story, hearing her talk about the conditions of living in China. And, and they ended up raising about $3,000. And that, in 1887, that $3,000 looks like about $100,000 right now. So $100,000, a tenth of a million dollars was raised this one week before Christmas. And they were able to send three more women to China to help support Lottie Moon. And I love this when she's, because she was constantly asking for more people, right? Here's one of the things she wrote appealing to the women. 
In city and in village, thousands of women will never hear the gospel until women bear it to them. They will admit women, but men cannot gain access to their homes, nor will they come to church. The only way for them to hear the good news of salvation is from the lips of a foreign woman. Are there not some, yea, many, who find it in their hearts to say, here am I, send me? But not just that. She wrote to the men, and this one, this one stuck with me, and uh, she says, the young man should ask himself not if it is his duty to go to the heathen, but if he may, da- if he may dare stay at home. And then it's funny because we often ask ourselves, God, do you want me to go do this thing? You know, and, and in this context, God, do you want me to go serve in, in missions? And she's saying, that's not the question you ought to be asking. The, the question you ought to be asking is, dare I stay here at home when there are people around the world dying without Jesus. By the time Lottie Moon passed away, more than 1,400 Chinese had been baptized, including a man who would later go on to start a church that had nearly 4,000 members in it. The the call is clear. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, Acts 1.8, going back to that Matthew 28. Go therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, I absolutely believe that God is concerned about our, our families, our friends, even our jobs. But, but God's concern for, or God's call for us to be a church who is teaching and sharing the name of Jesus Christ to the world is of supreme priority. Lottie Moon had a distinct passion for unreached people groups. These are people who've never even heard the gospel, never heard the name of Jesus, and there is no history of a Christian influence or even a gospel proclamation in their, in their like, culture, in their area, in their region. And so I want to show you all something really quick. It's called the, uh, the Joshua Project, and they actually have an app, which you'll see back up here. But the Joshua Project, if you were to go home and Google this, just Joshua Project, uh, what you'll see is an organization, a Christian organization that has covered all of the world, as much as they possibly can, getting, gathering data about the various unreached people groups. And there's a really cool app you can get. If you were to go to the App Store and just type Joshua Project, you'll get this thing called the Unreached People of the Day. And you'll actually get information like today's people, Hanai in Vietnam. You see there's 20,000 of them. In the world, there's 744,000. They're an ethnic religion. They don't have the Bible in their language. Their progress is completely unreached have their language. No one's even begun to translate the Bible. And you can even search by other countries if you're just curious or interested. You can learn so much about the unreached people groups. And right here behind me, this is an incredible map. All of the green area is Christianity is significant and established. The yellow is, it's, it's, it's growing, it's happening. But that red, that area right there, and we're, we're going to stay on this map for a while, that red is completely unreached. But not only is it unreached, but it's incredibly hostile to the gospel. That area in the red is where they don't just have difficulties sharing the Bibles and God's word and praying. It is illegal and in a lot of places will get you killed. That there are laws in place that permit the uh, persecution and the killing of Christians who are acting as insurgents, essentially disrupting the government, disrupting the peace. It's known as the 1040 window. I think I might have this up there. Approximately 4.95 billion individuals residing in approximately 8,435 distinct people groups are in the 1040 window. So really quick, 1040 stands for latitude lines and marks the area on the globe where those countries are. 69% of these people groups are considered unreached and have a population of 3 billion This means approximately 62% of the individuals in the 1040 window live in an unreached people group. The 1040 window is home to some of the largest unreached people groups in the world. 
such as the Shaikh, Yadava, Turks, Moroccan Arabs, Pashtun, Jat, and Burmese. Now, 3.06 billion. Last time I checked, I think we're getting close to world population, seven, eight billion people. That's almost half the population that is living a life apart from Jesus Christ and all of the pain that that brings, all the destruction that that brings, all the brokenness that that brings. And Lottie had a passion to go to these people, to go to these people groups. And God is calling us to them. Should we be asking ourselves whether or not we need to go? Or should we be asking ourselves, how dare I stay? Something really cool about Denver, though. We have a unique situation kind of in this part of the country. We have a minimum of 23 foreign people groups living in our city. 23 entirely different countries. We have the nations of the world coming to us. Um, a student and I, uh, named Levi, we got to go to a Mongolian like Independence Day festival over near um, uh, Denver University. 3,000 Mongolians actually live here in Denver. They come here, a lot of them get their, uh, their, their degrees and then return home. Imagine how much more effective a person who's from Mongolia coming here, hears the gospel, takes the gospel back to Mongolia with them. How effective will that person be compared to me? I, I mean, guys, I struggle without having like Chick-fil-A nearby. And I'm, <laughs> I ate some of their food and it was hard. It was real hard. I'm super picky. I need my mac and cheese. And uh, it's incredible, y'all. We can, we can be right here. In, in Denver alone, um, almost like close to 50% of the people have zero connection to a church. In Lakewood, 150,000 people, 66 or 65% of the population of Lakewood, where we are right now, has zero connection or relationship to a church. So the odds are pretty good that your neighbor, either left, right, cross, top, bottom, whichever, isn't at a church right now. The field is, is, is ripe for harvest. Here's the last thing. The name um, Patrick Henry might, might not ring a bell to everyone in here. If you love American history, you might recognize this name. But Patrick Henry, um, for, for many of us, I think he had one of the most impactful call to arms like in all of American history. So in a second, a video is going to play behind me. It's kind of just a retelling of, of what happened on this day when Patrick Henry got up to speak. From the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the cracks of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it the gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. It was March 1775 at St. John's Church in Virginia when Patrick Henry got up to speak to call to arms the people of America to begin militias, to begin a military force because war was upon them and he knew what was required, revolution. Church, the time is now. The, the, the call has never been more clear. There are people who need this message, who need the transformation of Jesus Christ, and they're already here in our city. They're here in our family. If, 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 if the answer is to go, then we must go. If, if God is saying, help your spouse to love Jesus more, then go. 
If, if God is saying, help lead your children to walk in paths of righteousness, then go. If God is saying, be a light, be a beacon in your workplace, in your community, in your small group, then go. No longer can we be complacent with just having a little 30 second devotional time as we get scraps of scripture from Instagram or Facebook. We need to be diving head first into God's word, saturating our very souls with who God is, that his call will be non-ignorable, that we can be so clear of what he desires, that we can persevere when times get hard, and that we have a recognition that no longer can we be okay with the blood of our Christian brothers and sisters being poured out on the ground across the world unknown to us, ignored by us. There is a call to arms, church. Now I recognize we may not all be called to be career missionaries like Lottie Moon, but we can still pray and support them. I recognize we may not all be prepared to share the gospel with our neighbors, but we can spend time reading God's word and praying for him to equip us. And I understand there may be, not all of us may even believe that God is real. But let me assure you this, God's call is real. And he's asking you, he's inviting you to join him in a relationship and a mission a call to arms, a revolution to see the world saved and reconciled to Jesus Christ through his grace and his blood that was spilled on the cross. Church, how will you respond? Let's pray.